Mr. Nigel Farage. Thank you, Donald, and good evening, everybody. If you think about the big momentous changes over the course of the last couple of years, Brexit, what was it about? It was about taking back control of our country. The Trump win, what was that about? It was about America first. And think about what the Hungarian Prime Minister, Viktor Orban, has been saying. He's been saying, we don't want Brussels telling us what we can and can't do, and the Poles have said the same and now had their voting rights removed. And, of course, three months ago, we saw a referendum being held in Catalonia, uh, and the police doing everything they could, including injuring 900 people, to prevent that vote that the separatists wanted to take Catalonia out of Spain. Whichever way you cut it, it is nationalism. It is the belief in nation-state that has been shaping global politics over the course of the last couple of years. And I want to know from you tonight, is a return to nationalism a bad thing. And indeed, what does that word, nationalism, mean to you? Tell me what you think by calling me on 0345 6060 973. You can text to 84850. You can tweet using the hashtag Farage and LBC at LBC. And of course, you can watch us live on Facebook and comment there too. Now, a few moments ago, 2,700 polling stations in Catalonia closed. This the general election that the Spanish PM Rajoy called, uh, and his hope is uh, that this will end the nationalist revolt. It will end those who want Catalonia to be a separate country, stop them having legitimacy. Well, I want to get some flavour and some feel as to what's been going on in Barcelona and elsewhere today. And we're going back to Jim Kent, the owner of Barcelona City FM, who we've spoken to quite a lot in the last few months. Good evening, Jim. Good evening, Nigel. Hi, so the polls have closed. Just give us some feel as to what the flavour's been like today. Well, there hasn't been a huge amount of action on the street. For sure, one thing that we are looking for is the voter turnout. Now, voter turnout in the most recent referendum, of course, as you know, was 43% for the uh, illegal referendum. For these autonomous elections, we are expecting an extremely high turnout. For sure, everybody here in this autonomous region knows that their vote counts. And yep. what we suspect is that the, the higher the turnout, the more likely it is that we may just get a, a pro-unity Spanish outcome of this vote. Right, but the last, I mean, looking at the opinion polls, uh, seems to me the whole thing is completely neck and neck. Would that be fair? Yes, no, you're right. Different uh, Here in Catalonia itself, they haven't permitted any polls in the last 11 days. And there are no exit polls as, okay. as such. But you're quite correct. All of the other unofficial polls have indeed indicated uh, this is going to go down to the wire. This is a real razor edge election here in Catalonia tonight. And Carlos Puigdemont, the deposed president of the region, uh, of course, ran his campaign from Brussels, where he's effectively in exile. But there were also politicians campaigning from prison in Madrid. Is that right? Yeah, this is quite a remarkable situation. You're, you're quite right. So Or Oriol Junqueras is still locked up. Now, what's interesting, so he is the possibly the largest party that is pro-independence, uh, and he himself is locked up, with Puigdemont being the actual official leader of the second largest party that supports uh, uh, separation. So for people in general, they should bear in mind that Catalonia, although there are only 135 seats up for grabs, there are six political parties here with three in favour of unity and three in favour of separation. Uh, so we will be okay. looking really, really carefully, not just at the, the size of the number of votes for each party, but what this really means for these two coalitions, one for and one against. I'm just getting through, actually, Jim, and it's obviously an unofficial exit poll, but Reuters are putting it out, and they're saying the separatist ERC and the Unionist Citizens Party are neck and neck in the race to be the biggest party uh, in the new parliament. So, Jim, assuming that this is very close, but you suspect with a big turnout, perhaps a small majority in favour of continued unity with Spain, in effect... This crisis doesn't really end, does it? No, it, it doesn't. I would say there are two things to look for. We suspect that one of these parties of this six, the socialists, we suspect that their vote may collapse. 
tonight. And this is because right. uh, the, the socialists themselves, they were pro-unity. Um, but however, in Madrid, they themselves, they've aligned themselves closely with the PP, uh, which means that here in Catalonia, people do not feel as though they are remaining true to their socialist values. So on the basis of the socialist collapse, once again, that suggests that the pro-secessionists this is for an independent Catalonia. It mm. looks like they might be uh, successful. However, there is a huge problem here that even if the independents are successful, now we know that Junqueras, who is locked up in a prison in Madrid, and Puigdemont, who is currently in a hotel room somewhere in Belgium, they, the two of them have also fallen out. So a question will remain, even if the separatists were successful, who would become the new president of Catalonia? Right now, no one can provide an answer for that. No, uh, I, it, absolutely bizarre, the circumstances of all of this. Um, do you know what time tonight we can expect the result? Yes, you should. Uh, I, I expect I will be myself tuning back into LBC at 10 o'clock tonight with great interest, because that's right. when we suspect we will start getting results um, back out of the, the official results will start coming out at that time. Terrific. Jim, thank you very, very much indeed. We're going to watch this closely through the evening. That was Jim Kent, owner of Barcelona City FM. Uh, and Jim can't predict, you know, which side is going to come out with a majority, but makes the very interesting point that even if the separatists had a majority in Parliament, the leaders of those two parties have fallen out and equally, one of them's in prison and the other is in a hotel room in Brussels. Uh, and this has, by the way, happened before in our country. Because in 1981, the hunger striker, Bobby Sands, uh, who, was, who was interned in prison in Northern Ireland, was elected from prison as a member of Parliament, and he died shortly thereafter. So we have seen this in our country before. So nationalism, what is nationalism? Well, there's a variety of definitions you can get in a dictionary. A nation's wish, an attempt to be politically independent, advocacy of, or support for political independence of a particular nation or people, a great or too great a love of your own country, or identification with one's own nation and supports for its interests to the detriment of other parties. So the word nationalism itself is pretty evocative. Uh, it upsets some people. It fills others with a huge sense of pride. Is it, is nationalism necessarily a bad thing? I'm going to ask that question to Robert in Bristol, a new caller to the show. Good evening, Robert. Good evening, Nigel. It's not a bad thing. Um, I've been a nationalist uh, back in 1974 when we tried to stop going into the common market. Um, yep. I've been a nationalist because <clears throat> I, uh, I, I want to draw a difference between a, a Catalonian nationalist and a UK nationalist. I'm a nationalist to my country, and that includes England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales. And I don't want to see any divisions on that. But I'm a nationalist because I want our courts and our laws to be decided here and not in Brussels and Luxembourg. I want, I want our own <coughs> yep. fishing and agricultural policies. If you go down to the southwest and go down and see fishermen down there, you'll, you'll hear a different type of language and argument about uh, Brussels and how they've controlled and destroyed a lot of the trading agreements um, and I want to control our borders and this isn't from a racist or any other room, this is from a nationalist point of view because I love my country and I want to preserve it the way it is because it's got a lot of good things about it and a lot of good things to offer. I mean, when So I Robert, really you're a nationalist, sorry? you're a nationalist oh, are yeah. you an extremist as well? Uh, oh, no, no. well I'd love to think I was, but I'm afraid I haven't quite got it there, Nigel. <laughs> right. um, but do I you see, back, Robert, Robert, back, do you see that some people, some people look at nationalism and they think, you know, that's what brought the horrors of the 1930s. Oh. Um, I, I, and as there's a lot of people that think nationalism can be dangerous. Do you think there are circumstances in which it can be? Well, we've seen it. We've experienced this in, like you said, in Nazi Germany and what have you. I think there's a distortion on some of these arguments because I am very pro-Brexit, and incidentally, I'm very grateful for 
the work you put into that that whole Thank thing. You. But uh, uh, yeah, the, the Remainers and people like this call sometimes people like me uh, your little Englanders. Well, I want to, exp- although I'm a nationalist and I b- believe and love my country extremely, I want us to be able to trade with the whole world. So although I'm a nationalist, I'm an internationalist, actually. I, I, yep. I'm far more... I, I, my horizons are far wider than the confines of Brussels. And if I ever joined a golf club and I had to pay and fight my way out of it if I decided to leave the way this country is having to now, <laughs> so much for that golf club. Uh, it's a disgrace. Robert, and- Robert, I want to say thank you uh, for your call, for your passion. And yeah. I didn't realise when you left a golf club you had to pick up a huge bill. But there we go. Robert, I thank you. Um, I wonder what Sanjay in Loughborough makes of that word nationalism. Hi, hi Nigel. Um, I completely agree with nationalism. Um, it, to me, it's uh, somebody who is loyal to their country, who's a patriot, somebody who loves their country and will defend their country. That's a nationalist. And I am a British nationalist. Um, I'm of Indian heritage, but that's my yep. heritage. I am British, though, no matter what. Um, to me, um, w- one thing I've noticed this year in this country, there's something really bad is happening to the fact that when we can't talk out, when nationalists can't really talk out about real threats towards this country, me personally feel like Islam is the biggest threat. Um, and then people get arrested for hate crime and things. That's the biggest worry and problem, even though there's freedom of speech <coughs> in the UK. That's my m- major concern right now. Sanjay, you're a, a very passionate fella. Uh, can I just ask you, do you think that too much nationalism can be a bad thing? It, it can if it verges onto uh, colour of skin, racism nationally, it, then it can be bad. But the way it right. is now, I'll be honest with you, racism was the biggest threat. Now, racism is so 70s, 60s, and back then. Now I'm seeing that people aren't racist anymore. They're just national, and, and, and they just love their country, and they want to defend it. That's how I feel. Sanjay? Our British nationalist in Loughborough, thank you very much for your call. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show exclusively on LBC and my last show of 2017, live from Washington, D.C., and it's now 7.15. The nation-state has made a huge comeback. Brexit, Trump, many things happening in Poland, Hungary, and indeed in Catalonia as the polls have just closed and we await with interest the results. Nationalism is back and it's being talked about and I'm asking you whether you think it's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, What do I think of nationalism? Well, of course, I believe in the nation state. I've been campaigning for it uh, for nearly a quarter of a century. Uh, But I would say this. I think nationalism is a bit like alcohol. Yeah, a little bit of it actually seems to make the world a better place and makes people feel pretty happy and pretty good about themselves. Too much is disastrous and leads to negativity and perhaps possibly, in very extreme cases, even hatred. So I think a sensible, balanced nationalism is a very, very good thing. And one of the fascinations for those of us that have fought against the European Union is that I now believe it's the EU itself that is nationalist, extreme nationalists. They want their flag, their anthem, their presidents, their armies. Uh, So anyone that tells you that the European Union is the antidote to nationalism ought to look, I think, a bit more closely at the organisation. I wonder what Danny, who's calling from Croydon and is a new caller to the show, what does nationalism, Danny, mean to you? Uh, Nationalism, well, first of all, Nigel, I want to praise you um, on being able to, you know, on bringing up uh, sensitive topic, topics, topics that people don't want to discuss, but you have got the courage, well, you know, you've got the courage and the know-how to be able to uh, to bring that up. So first of all, let me praise you for that uh, initially. Um, I basically think that, you know, there's nothing wrong with discussing nationalism. What it means to me is being able to make your own laws, being able to implement um, um, uh, new, new laws or, 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 or revamp existing laws that are potentially out of date without having other people tell you what to do. Um, you know, I think it's, it's like your neighbour down the street telling you how to bring up your kids. You know, I mean, you know, if you're a sensible person, you're a law-abiding person, you know, general common sense will tell you what to do. But I just think that um, basically we should be uh, in a position where we make our own laws. Yeah, too much mm. of it, yeah, it can be a bad thing because yeah, the world that's is right. changing. We, we've got to, um, the world is changing. We've got to adjust to that. But, you know, the sense of pride, remembering things about your country, things in the past, what is wrong with that? I love it, you know, and, and, mm. and I think that mm. 
you know, you should be, you should have an element of, of some element of control in terms of uh, laws and in terms of, of, of being able to make decisions uh, for your country. In a way, Danny, in a way, Danny, we could also sort of almost rename it nationism, couldn't we? <laughs> it's about sure belief. In, it, well, but it's about, but it is, isn't it? It's about belief in yeah. the nation and all the things that you have just said. Now, Danny, I'm with you. Um, but it is, I, I do think we need to warn people that too much nationalism, extreme nationalism is bad news. I mean, there was a, a big demo uh, took place in Warsaw uh, the other day. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment uh, that most Polish, uh, you know, nationalists or patriots feel like this. But in that crowd, you know, you had people screaming, pure Poland, white Poland, refugees get out. That is not the kind of nationalism, Danny, that you want or I want, is it? That's a bit too far. I mean, that, that, that's going a bit too far. And you're not moving with the, you're not moving with the times, are you? Um, but you know, you, you, there is a fine line uh, towards it. I bet you know. Uh, I, I think someone that I know, um, what was labelled a prejudice for, for, for saying that he's a nationalist. Um, I mean, that, mm. that's also going a bit too far. I mean, you've mm. got to have a right to voice an opinion. You know, I mean, you know, yeah, yeah. whether you're right or wrong. Yeah, yeah. You know, if yeah. you agree with someone, great. If you don't agree, to disagree. But you can't just dismiss people's ideas you need to hear what they're saying and you say look that's your idea this is mine let's agree yep. to disagree uh, but in a sensible way and you know and that's what we do and that's what we do on lbc every single day and i thank you very much indeed for your call this is really interesting because if i'd had this phone in 10 years ago if 10 years ago you know i'd said i think nationalism is a good thing i believe in nationalism i think it's right what's going on across the western world my guess is there'd be a lot more people screaming about it and saying it was awful and now i think it has got a form of acceptance it's a big big change pete in devon says how can pride in your nation be a bad thing pride breeds positivity lack of pride breeds the opposite nationalism in its true form nigel is a belief in your country's cultural identity and people's freedom and democracy free of political and or ideological influence often conflated with national socialism that is a collective political identity heavy stuff there but most of you thinking that gentle nationalism is a good thing if you think it's a bad thing please call me on 0345 6060 and i go next to christopher who's calling from liverpool another new caller to the show good evening good evening Nigel. It's great to speak to you um i was just wondering in your opinion what would be the difference between a nationalist and someone who's patriotic because when I think of a, of a nationalist, I think of groups such as the EDL, Britain First, and also there's other cases across Europe, such as Russia, for example. You see groups who are yeah. so nationalist that they, to a point, they see themselves as superior to other people. So in this, in this case with Catalonia, I would say it's more of being patriotic rather than nationalist, but that's just my opinion. Yeah, so. I... No, I do understand what you mean, but I also think patriotism can go to extremes too, uh, because you can take patriotism to a level where you think you are above everybody else in every way, um, and that could make you pretty hostile in many ways to your neighbours. I, um, Christopher, uh, I, I remember back in 1999, the day after I was first elected as an MEP, there were three of us from UKIP, and at the press conference in Westminster, one of the journos asked, are you nationalists? Uh, and I said, no, we're nationists. So, you know, I, I, think, I think this word, I think this word nationalism uh, does bring uh, one or two negative connotations with it. But actually, in reality, uh, Christopher, just because a few extremists try to hijack it. I mean, I, mean, I was told years ago, we mustn't fly the Union Jack because that's the symbol of the National Front. And, of course, the answer to that is, don't let them own it. The rest of us ought to own it. And I feel the same, Christopher, really, about the word nationalism. I think it's time we talked about it and made it respectable. Yeah, I completely agree. I think you hit the, point, hit the nail on the head where it's the word is, in a way, being hijacked by other groups. Yes. And, obviously, yes. because of the media, it's then being betrayed as yep. a negative thing. But, yeah. Oh, I, I mean, if you look at mainstream media, much of mainstream media in Britain, America, and certainly across Europe, you know, the word nationalist is used as a pejorative term. He or she 
is a nationalist. It means they're evil, they're bad, they're awful. And I want to fight back against that. And I thank you very much indeed, Christopher, for your call. Chris says, I see nationalism as simply showing patriotism and having pride in one's country. What can possibly be wrong with that? And why is this now a negative? Well, Chris, actually, uh, in the eyes of the liberal elite, it's been a negative for a very, very long time. Uh, Kenley is calling me from Barnet. Good evening. Hi there. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. I've been wanting to say this for a long time. It's Mm. uh, And it's the word Esperanto. Why wasn't that um, taught in every school since the EU began. Why does well, it very, very chaos of babble? <laughs> yeah. No one can speak the same language and you're running a government? Hello? OK. Uh, uh, Kenley, can I tell yeah. you that uh, Esperanto was a very strong aspiration of many of the people who built the European Union back in the 1950s and 60s and 70s. They wanted Esperanto to be learnt. They actually invested quite a lot of money um, in Esperanto becoming the language of Europe uh, and they got frankly nowhere with it because people uh, want to learn their own national languages first and then they'll choose which other one they they go for so big attempts were made to popularize it and they simply fell flat on their face yeah, but as far as i'm concerned if the eu was to be the success that it is then it should have have at least yes. esperanto as a second language surely well i think uh, uh, no you, i think you're right you disagree Look, with that no i don't i think you're right and i think actually it's very very difficult for a nation for a country to operate and exist if you've got people within it that speak different languages. There are exceptions to it, you know, Switzerland, for example, uh, but in general, I think for a nation to work, to be cohesive, I think you've all got to speak the same language. And if the European Union, with its flag and its anthem um, and its stated aim of being a full state, um, I think the fact that people speak Greek and German and and the other 20 languages uh, makes it very very difficult for it ever to work. And also, I'd like to say, why is the Scottish National Party not considered racists? I mean, they want to make Scotland purely <sighs> Scottish. And they're not considered racist, they're considered forward-thinking progressive well, people, well, and they call do Donald know. Trump racist, or they call... Do you know, they just know you're I can't so right. I cannot understand You're so that. right. I went up in 2013 to Edinburgh, uh, where I was attacked by a mob of 80 to 90 Scottish nationalists. Uh, they, words and phrases they were using, not just about me, but about the English. If I dared to use that language against any other group, I would have been arrested on the spot. They were able to do it, and much of the Scottish media thought it was my own fault because I shouldn't have come north of the border. And how is it? that Scottish nationalism, Welsh nationalism, Irish nationalism has been tolerated, almost encouraged in this country by much of the media, and anybody that professes English nationalism is evil. Kenley, I I, I frankly don't understand it, and I thank you for your call. And just a little postscript to that story. So it was pretty ugly, uh, the scene in that street, really ugly. Um, And a taxi was called to get me out of there. Uh, And as I tried to get him a taxi, they said to the taxi driver, don't take this Farage guy, otherwise we'll find where you live. And he was paralysed with fear. And the police then decided for my own safety to lock me in a pub. It was great. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC, live from Washington, D.C. It's 7.30. Is the return of nationalism as part of the debate right across the Western world a good thing or a bad thing? And so far, most of you seem to think, actually, nationalism, provided that it's balanced and it's sensible, is pretty much a good thing. Now, I'm still here in Washington, D.C., where it really has been a pretty momentous week with, you know, the first year... Of this administration, despite having majorities in both houses on Capitol Hill, the president has been unable to get any major legislation through. But this week, they've got through tax reform, $1.5 trillion of tax cuts. And Trump himself last night hailed the passage 
saying it was an historic victory for the American people. And Trump and his fellow Republicans gathered at the White House to celebrate these big tax changes, the biggest tax changes since 1986 when Reagan was president. We are making America great again, said Mr. Trump. I don't know if we'll have bigger moments. I hope we do. It's the largest tax cut in the history of our country. And I can tell you, uh, last night, out around town, the Republicans were partying and doing so in style. And today, and this is really pretty incredible stuff, AT&T have said that they will pay a $1,000 Christmas bonus to more than 200,000 employees and have promised to make $1 billion in new investments in the United States next year once the tax reform bill has moved fully into law. Comcast, NBC Universal have said it will award a $1,000 bonus to more than 100,000 workers based on the passage of this tax reform. Boeing have said that it's going to make a $300 million employee-related and charitable investment as a result of tax reform legislation. Wells Fargo has said that there's now going to be a $15 per hour minimum wage for its staff, said it was prompted by the tax plan. And that's big because in most American states, uh, minimum wage is about $10. So a minimum wage of $15 that some of these firms are now going to pay really is something. And you can, uh, like Trump, as I do, you can hate Trump. Uh, you can argue that these tax cuts are going to significantly widen the deficit if you want to. But I'll make a prediction for 2018. The American economy is going through the roof. Be in no doubt about it. Business confidence here is simply soaring. Back to the question of nationalism. And Robert is calling me from Dunwich. Robert, what does that word nationalism mean to you? Hi, Nigel. Um, first to my call. Um, I am reminded, actually, of Donald Trump's inauguration speech, and he made a point yes. of saying that he'd written this, and he said, and that for some reason it's always stuck with me, he said, when you open your heart to patriotism, there is no room for prejudice. And I think what Donald Trump has cr cracked on is that there is a positivity that can be unleashed um, if you can get all the different people in your country to start pulling together. It's a bit along the John F. Kennedy line, ask not what your country can do for you, but do what you can do for your country. Yeah. It's an old yeah. idea. Um, we've become very selfish in the West as we've become rich. And that's normal. I mean, you can't expect that. But I think we, it's, a, it's not a bad idea to look back in, under the flag, under an anthem, to, to sort of work together for the country and for the community. And I think Trump's positive spin on this and i know people you know that these people who say he's a supremacist and a kkk supporter oh i know it's I insanity know. The, the attacks are just so childish but he is i mean you've just mentioned the economy look i was in the city for 23 years they're above three percent growth now i agree with yep. you i yep. reckon the u.s is going to hit four percent next year and if you want to pull people out of poverty it's by getting the whole country to come together and work together and, and you can hide yeah, that. it's this, it's this, it's the feeling of being part of a team, but it's also optimism, isn't it? Optimism breeds yeah. success. Belief in what you're doing breeds success. And your point about the words that Trump used about opening your heart to patriotism, but being inclusive in the way in which you do it. I was there. I was there. I was a you know a few yards away was, from him I thought uh, when he said that. I thought it was a beautiful line, and it stuck with me. And I'll tell you something, he is gonna, he's going to make that economy take off. And I'll yeah. tell you what's going to happen. The leftists who seem to run the Western world right now and the media and the political elites, they hate Trump because here's a man who campaigns on a manifesto and then delivers on his promise. They don't like that mm. competition no. over in Europe. No. But, but no. he is going to no. deliver that economy. He's going to pull the poor people. He's going to give them work, like you just said, Wells Fargo, minimum salary of $15. And he's going to show the Western mm. world that there's a different and better way. And that's what this Brexit is all about. Well, you know? I, Robert, I hope and I actually believe that you're right. And it's interesting that you, you know, talk about that inauguration speech because in most of the media, 
here in Washington, D.C., and across the world, they took his inauguration speech and said it was narrow nationalism. There we go. I thank you very much indeed for your call. Les says to me, Nigel, look, instead of focusing on how to improve one's own country, we should be focused on how to improve humanity as a whole. Therefore, acting collectively is imperative. I think you've got an agenda, says Les. You know the history of nationalism. Well, I tell you what, Les, I also know the history of creating fake states and saying, look, let's get rid of nationalism at a nation state level. Let's club everybody together in a big group and that'll be fine. And just think how that worked out for Yugoslavia, a complete and utter and total disaster. And here we are in the European Union attempting to repeat the project. So I think supra nationalism uh, can actually be pretty dangerous too. Ben, in response to the economic news uh, coming out of DC here today, Ben says, I want to live in America. And Mark says, I think we must be the only country that actually worries about nationalism. Most EU countries I've lived in were very proud of their nation. Well, certainly there has been a very big agenda amongst much of our political class to decry belittle and even demonize anybody that dared stand up for the country and i have to say i made the comment about the union jack earlier and mr osborne from gillingham says to me the union jack was hijacked by the right because it was abandoned by the left and that may well be true but i tell you what the union jack has been taken back from extremists and now you see kids wearing union jack t-shirts all over the world i think it's great i wonder what jake in brighton thinks good evening jake good evening nigel hi um pleasure to speak to uh it's in technology great it's great to be speaking to somebody so far across over there in dc such a sort of notoriously nefarious uh, personality as yourself uh nigel just want to say it's brilliant to speak to you thank you so what do you think of nationalism jake does the word worry you i just want want to start off with a um about about nationalism really i mean i just want to start off with a quote reminded me of a quote from um somebody um Nationalism is an infantile disease. It is the measles of mankind. And that was a uh, certain Albert Einstein, who I would sort of suggest is slightly smarter than yourself, Nigel, Nigel even, and maybe even smarter than a lot of your callers. Um, and, I, you know, I, I do think nationalism is, is a scourge on society. And I think if you... Uh, have you heard of a book called The Denial of Death by Ernest Becker? It won the Pulitzer Prize in 1974. I, I, have, I haven't read it, but I've heard of it, certainly, yes. Very good book, very good book. It it deals with something called terror management theory and death anxiety. And I think one of the things that nationalism uh, does for people is it gives them a a sense of belonging and sense of when when really essentially they're they're, they're scared of dying, which we all have, and scared of uh, why we create cultures and religions. Uh, Again, so I do think it's it's, it's slightly disingenuous and sanctimonious of you, Nigel, to suggest that nationalism um, hasn't been a bane and a scourge on humanity since its inception. Um, and well, to come I think, across with all this nonsense about um, uh, what, what, what was your uh, your your rebuttal against it? I can't remember. Jake, I've made the point. I've made the point that I think nationalism uh, in the right form is correct, normal, and what human beings across the world want. All right, but I've also made the point that if nationalism moves to an extreme position where it st- where it starts to exclude others or it starts to uh, say that others are deeply inferior, then I think it's very dangerous. And and it's all well and good for Albert Einstein to make that comment about nationalism. And and I understand that because, you know, look what national socialism did, you know, to Germany, Austria, etc. in the 1930s. But we're not talking about that. We're not equating, you know, national socialism was a political ideology. So, Jake, I, I, I would just say this to you that all across the world, every single year, new countries are created because people, through the principle of national self-determination, choose to govern themselves. And I, I'm, let me ask you, what's wrong with that? Well, I'd just say, I'd just say look, look, I mean, tell me one good thing nationalism has done for humanity. And I'd just like to say, I mean, all this, all this stuff about flags and none of these things can be taken into the ground with us. We're all going to die. We're all going to die one day. And the maggots don't care what flag we have adorned around our body. So I think it's sort of, I mean, I don't want to get into that sort of, I don't understand mm. naive when I'm talking like that, but quite honestly, what has nationalism done for humanity? Well, it's given us, perhaps given us 
a sense of order, a sense of, I hope, in many cases, wanting to help, uh, you know, our fellow man, who, and particularly if they share the same nationality as us. Um, and I think nationalism operated across the West in particular with democracy has been a very, very good and a very successful model. Jake, you take a different view. I thank you for your call. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusive in LBC, live from Washington, and it's 7.45. Well, before the break, Jake was asking me, what's nationalism ever done? Well, I'll tell you what I, I, I would say to you, Jake. Um, nation states, let, let's just think about it. Think about Europe. Lots of different nation states. You travel 100, 150 miles across Europe. You find different people speaking different languages with different cultures, different cheeses, different wines, different, uh, different ways of enjoying themselves, different sports in many cases. And think of that Europe, and then compare it to what Mr. Juncker wants to build. One Europe where everything has been harmonised, homogenised, pasteurised. Um, one year, maybe one Europe one day speaking Esperanto. Which of those Europes do you think would be more fun to visit and travel around? And I just think that individual nation states give us what we want. That gives us the ability to feel we're part of something we identify with. We're part of something we're prepared to pay our taxes to. We're part of something that in extremists we'd be prepared to do something to defend. Um, and that is, I think, what nation states give people, a sense of belonging and, I think, a sense of pride. And I can't see anything wrong with it unless it's taken to wild extremes. I wonder what Joanne and Edgware, another new caller to the show. Good evening, Joanne. Hi, Nigel. Hello. So what does nationalism mean to you, Joanne? Do you know what, Nigel? You speak so much sense. And if I'm honest with you, I, I really feel like you get so much stick um, and you just don't deserve it. And I feel like you speak the, you speak the mind of so many British people um, that are actually too scared to speak up and say what you say. So I first of all want to applaud you for that. Um, That's kind of you, thank you. you no, honestly, it's, it's the truth. Um, and a lot of people will say it, it, it in the door when they've got their door shut and when they're talking about how the, not just Britain, London, um, the UK, but the rest of the world, how it's changing. It's, it's sad because we're all being diluted, if you like, and it's, it's infuriating to see. Um, Dil- when when right, you say diluted... Yeah. Joanne, when you say we're, diluted, we're not, we're not allowed to be um, nationalists. We're not allowed to be proud of of who we are and what our grandparents and our great grandparents done for us in the past. We're not allowed to be proud and and British anymore, are we? Or if we well, are, then we're racist. Well, do you know something, Joanne? I think that five or ten years ago, I would have absolutely agreed with everything you've just said that people were frightened to express an opinion that was patriotic, that could be labelled as nationalist. And one of the one of the attacks on me, Joanne, over the years has been, ah, he's a nationalist. And they've the, the left kind of owned that word and made it into a bad thing. But I think, Joanne, things are changing and changing really, really quickly. And I I genuinely believe that what 2016 represented, firstly with Brexit, and then with the election of Donald Trump, I think 2016 was the year the nation state made a comeback. The year people said, you know what, we're sick to death of giving big decision-making powers to people who don't even live in our country, to people you can't vote for. So, Joanne, I think, I think it is now easier for you and others to talk about this stuff than it was five or ten years ago. It is definitely easier. I think it is, um, if I'm honest, Nigel, when I woke up the morning of the referendum result, I could not believe it. I actually woke up to two text messages from my close friends who said, I can't believe we've actually done it. Because nobody expected it. Even the people that voted out didn't expect it. Um, and I did vote out, and I'm proud. I'm so proud of Britain for, for, for making that change. And I, I honestly believe. In fact, I know it's going to do Britain so it's, it's going to be it's going to be a success. I know it is, um, and I and I to be honest with you, I actually want to thank you again just for the fact that you actually 
Um, I, I've listened to you a lot on LBC recently. I believe in it. Um, but not, not just Joanne, that. Joanne, I believe in it. I believe in it. Um, I believe in it. And I, I, you know, I believe back in the early 1990s that we were heading in the wrong direction, that the European project would take away our democracy and that, and that it had to be fought. Joanne, I thank you for your call. And I say to you, be encouraged that actually it's become easier to speak about these things than it was. On Twitter, I get, so I take it that Jake, on the radio, he was the guy before the break, hates the EU because it's got a flag and an identity. I presume he hates it with the same passion. Well, EU nationalism is there and it is real. You should see them standing, ramrod straight to attention when I'm there in the European Parliament when the anthem plays. I don't do that. I stand up and turn my back. They don't like it, but that's how I feel. Uh, Nigel, having pride in your country should come as naturally as breathing. Nationalism is a great thing. Nothing builds a country stronger than being proud of it. A lot of you, a lot of you saying that. Patriotism is a good thing. Pride in your country promotes good values. Remember, when a seat on public transport was given to vulnerable people without the need for a TfL advert well that's transport for london um uh, yeah um i i think perhaps um as a society uh, whilst we are now talking a lot more about the nation about identity um i'm not sure our manners are necessarily as good perhaps as they were a few years ago peter is calling from wimbledon yet another new caller to the nigel farage show on lbc good evening hi nigel Good evening. So, nationalism, good thing or a bad thing? Well, it's a good thing. Um, and, you know, I, I was uh, saying to the to chap that answered the phone, you know, both my, my oh. great-grandfather and my grandfather fought in the war. Um, you know, at that time, nationalism was something that was, that was praised and encouraged. And now there's this sort of bizarre situation where people try to conflate uh, patriotism with nationalism. And you're right, it is a kind of play on words to, to try and conflate it with... Yeah. National socialism, which was the very thing that they risked their lives and many of their many of their friends died for. Um, and I think it's also quite interesting that you know it very much benefits the federal Europe to have the the nation states kind of um, attacked and for people to feel guilty to to stand up for them. And and you're right that Jake has just sort of attacked the nation state, but hasn't suggested what would be a great alternative. I mean, they're not perfect, but you know, is a federal Europe going to be any better? Well, actually, it's not going to be a federal Europe because what they're building isn't federal. What they're building is a centralised, unitary Europe where everything has to be the same and everybody has to obey the laws, the diktats that come from the centre. And you know what, Peter, and I mean this, I think, ultimately, whatever they try to do to impose a European sense of identity upon people living wherever it is, Portugal or Greece or Finland or Germany or whatever it is, ultimately they are going to feel an attachment to their nation state. They're going to feel that they're Portuguese first and they're European way down the list somewhere, maybe second, maybe even lower than that in terms of what they feel part of. And, and, and ultimately, Peter, that's why the European project isn't going to work well i hope so we will see i thank you for your call um and wish you all the best uh, and my last caller my last caller of the year is leon in hastings good evening leon yes hello um just to say you're my mep and very happy to be uh, have you as my mep and i've been voting for you always basically you're very kind thank you well i've been there a long time haven't i but uh... well, not much longer we all hope yeah, no, I agree with that. I should be sacked. I was the turkey that, that advocated voting for Christmas. I've done myself out of a job, and it's a very, very good thing. So, Leon, uh, you obviously, if, if you're voting for me, you obviously believe in nation-state. Well, yes, I, I've listened to the programme for the last hour, and a lot of people focus on the fact that nation is a country. But nation goes way beyond that. I mean, I look, from, look at it from a philosophical mm. perspective, and that is either we have two options – either statism or nationalism. Now, statism is basically a political view that you can bring all kinds of disparate people together and just unite them politically. Now, it just doesn't work. I mean, we've had statism now as basically a, a, a dogma for the last 50 years, and we're now seeing the results of statism, a fractured society, people against each other, everybody at each other's throats, 
statism just does not work because it cannot bring people together. Mm. However, nationalism is about is more than about just a boundary rather than a, or a country. It's about identity. It's about history. It's about culture. belonging, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's about yeah. bringing people together that have a common identity. That is what nationalism is, and only nationalism can properly work to unite a, 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 to mm. unite people together within a, within a, a, yeah. a from from a political political or whatever perspective. And Leon, do you know what? Do you know what? I'm going to leave it there because that was just a couple of really great sentences, beautifully explained. I thank you very much indeed for your call. And and Leon in Hastings there, another new caller to the show. I've been with you now for a year. I've tried my damnedest to get as many texts and tweets and Facebook messages and calls and I've tried to squeeze as much of that in to every single one of these programmes. Uh, I'm more than happy to speak to people, whatever their view, whatever they think of me, whatever they think of Brexit, whatever they think of Trump. Uh, I hope I've done my best to be as polite and civil as I possibly can. I hope you've enjoyed the show. I have to tell you, I've absolutely loved pretty much every single minute of it. It's over and out from me for 2017. I'll be back on the 2nd of January 2018. You've been listening to my last Nigel Farage show of 2017. I'm wishing you very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year.